So far in the thrilling world of chemistry, all of the reactions you've come across have looked like this one. What we've got here is a colourful and explosive reaction where one mole of A reacts with one mole of B to make one mole of X and one mole of Y. The reaction will be completed when all of the A and B has turned into X and Y, and everyone goes home happy. This reaction is one way. There are lots of reactions, however, that are two-way. That double arrow is extremely important. It means there's not just one, but actually two reactions going on at once. We're looking at a forward reaction, and we've got a reverse reaction, and they're both happening at the same time. So why don't you usually see this kind of thing? Well, to explain that, we need to introduce you to the idea of an equilibrium. Basically, a two-way reaction will be an equilibrium when the forward reaction is happening at the same rate as the reverse reaction. The overall effect of an equilibrium is that the reactions exactly cancel each other out, so we can't see anything. This doesn't mean that there is just as much x plus y as there is a plus b. In fact, the reaction will probably heavily favour one side. It's all about the rate rather than the quantity. One final point that's important is that we normally talk about reactions happening in a closed system, which basically means that you can't add or take anything away from the reaction. Let's look at a typical two-way reaction. This is a relatively simple reaction where we're putting in some nitrogen gas and some hydrogen gas and forming ammonia as our product. Because this reaction is two-way, there's also going to be some ammonia that's turning back into nitrogen and hydrogen. This reaction is at equilibrium, which means that ammonia is being created as quickly as it is turning back into nitrogen and hydrogen. But what if we wanted to suddenly increase the amount of ammonia and not have it turning back as quickly? There's actually a bunch of different things we can do that's going to change this equilibrium. We could change the concentration of the reactants, change the concentration of the products, change the pressure, or change the temperature. What is doing each of these things going to mean for our precious equilibrium that we worked so hard to obtain? In order to understand that stuff, we need to introduce you to Le Chatelier's principle, which tells us that when a dynamic equilibrium is disturbed, the position of the equilibrium changes to minimize the change. It's also important to understand what's meant by the position of the equilibrium. For example, in this reaction right now, you can simply think of the equilibrium being exactly in the middle, between the reactants and the products. Now let's say the equilibrium has shifted to the right. It's now closer to the product, ammonia, and this means that the forward reaction is going to be favoured. We'll see more NH3 getting produced, and there'll be less hydrogen and less nitrogen. Remember that equilibrium will still be reached after this change occurs, but its position will have shifted. Now think about the other possibility, which is that, for some reason that we'll get into soon, the equilibrium has shifted to the left. This means that the reverse reaction is the one that's being favoured, and so there will be less NH3 and more nitrogen and hydrogen. It's important to understand that even after these shifts, the reaction will still be at equilibrium. And once equilibrium is reached, you won't see changes since both the forward and backward reactions will be occurring at the same rate. It'll just mean that there's some more product or more reactant around. Now you know this, it should hopefully be a little easier to understand what good old Le Chatelier was getting at all those years ago. The most important part about that principle is the idea of wanting to minimize the change. Whatever we do to the reaction, the equilibrium will always shift so that it does the opposite of the change. Let's look at the reaction again briefly. What happens if we increase the concentration of the reactants? Well, the equilibrium isn't going to be at all happy about that. It's going to want to take those extra reactants and try and somehow turn them into product as quickly as it possibly can. The only thing it can do, therefore, is shift to the right. By favouring the forward reaction, the extra N2 or H2 can be turned into NH3, and the change will be minimized. What happens if we increase the concentration of the products? This is simply the reverse situation we just looked at. 
With this extra bit of ammonia, the reaction will do its best to reduce the amount of product, and it does this by shifting to the left and favoring the reverse reaction. We'll end up with less NH3 and more N2 and H2. What happens if we increase the pressure? This is a little more complicated, we're sorry to tell you. Pressure is about two things, which reactants and products are gas, and how many moles of gas there are on each side. This question isn't too hard to answer in this case, because everything is a gas. So on the left, we have one mole of nitrogen and three moles of hydrogen, giving us four moles of gas. On the right, we have two moles of ammonia, giving us two moles of gas. When we increase the pressure of the system, a closed system you'll remember, the equilibrium will respond by desperately reducing the pressure, duh, and it does this by favoring the side with the fewest moles of gas. Here that means moving to the right and favoring the forward reaction. More ammonia gets made. Clearly then, if we reduce the pressure of the system, the reaction's equilibrium will shift to favor the left-hand side, which has more moles of gas. Remember the equilibrium wants to oppose any change we make, and more moles of gas will increase the pressure within the system. What happens if we increase the temperature? Before we can discuss what happens when we increase the temperature of the system, maybe you can see what's coming though, we need to know if this reaction is exothermic or if it's endothermic. Normally you won't actually be told outright if a reaction is exothermic or endothermic. Thankfully for all of us, that doesn't matter, because the value of the enthalpy change let us know immediately anyway. Here for example, we know that the change in enthalpy for the forward reaction is negative meaning that the forward reaction produces heat and is exothermic. So back to the equilibrium, if we go and apply heat to the reaction, the equilibrium, in its mad state of panic, will try and cool the system. This can be done by favoring the reverse reaction, which will be endothermic. Therefore, if we increase the temperature, the equilibrium here will move to the left. Easy. One final thing to keep in mind, catalysts, those handy dandy things you learned about in the last video, don't shift the equilibrium at all. Instead of making a reaction go to completion faster than usual as they normally would, with two-way reactions, they make the reaction reach equilibrium more quickly.